Hello and welcome back to the Iron Man Experience, a podcast where we discuss anything and everything about society, art, culture, entertainment, movies, sports, and in particular cricket. In this episode, we are going to discuss about the T20 World Cup, summary of the group stages, some observations, what's working, what's not working, the big finals on Wednesdays, Wednesday and Thursday, and towards the end, what happens on Friday. Stick around till the end. And you will have a nice non-rhetorical, simple, clear understanding of what are the two or three things Team India can do better. Now, this is a slow burn podcast. This is not going to be a rapid, quick shot, quick, high pitched, high volume. This is going to be a regular one. So just giving you a heads up on that. So with that, let's dive in. So let's zoom out, right? We saw Team India play five matches. What were the key takeaways? The opening still dodgy. We're not seeing a fluent five over, seven over without any wicket loss kind of innings. Mr. Rohit Sharma is still struggling with a fluent hit at the park, right? Think of the Netherlands match. It was a laborious 50, right? Uh, I think it was dropped twice. He's not getting the mojo, you know, and somewhere I think there is muddle in the middle. And and that's primarily because maybe the captaincy and the hoo-ha that happened leading up to this transition of power, as it were, somewhere I sense that there is some thought clarity which is missing because that is essential for sublime timers like him. It's like how Mr. Surya Kumar Yadav is playing right now is because there is this thought clarity of the role definition of the execution. There's so much of instinct that is being backed, which is not being the case with uh, Mr. Rohit Sharma. Maybe he's trying too hard. Maybe he just needs to take a step back and relax. We don't know. We can't read his mind. But I I do sense that he's struggling mentally. And I do think that there is the hand-eye coordination, which has gone down a little bit. I don't know if it is because he's probably looking a little, uh, he's gained a couple of pounds. Uh, Is it because there is some other activity? If if there are like too many things to think about as a captain, is that weighing him down? All those things are, maybe, you know, it takes some time for people to settle down into captaincy. It's not like uh, instantaneous, you switch on, okay, now let me represent the biggest cricketing team in the world in in some shape, size or form, right? And so uh, that opening slot is not something that is working out well. Mr. KL Rahul, yes, he's scored and he's made those comments. I've heard some of the uh, press conferences. He's saying that he's confident he was anyways playing well. He came into this tournament with some good knocks. Agreed, but that was a completely different deck, different mindset, a different situation. A World Cup is a World Cup is a World Cup. And so the pressure quotient is very different. And we have seen in the past that when under pressure, his fluency seems to be a bit off. And the manner of dismissals, they have been just is chopping it onto the stumps. Somewhere or the other, I, I find there is, uh, again, the hand-eye coordination and the thought clarity of how do you structure the first three, four overs? Do you want to go hammer and tongs? Because he clearly takes some time. And I think both the openers in the in order to make a big bang theory or a big bang impression right at the start are somewhere losing the plot. And that's where you let the opposition in with a sniff and then the pressure comes on the middle order. Now, Mr. Virat Kohli, clearly he's in that zone right now. I still think that he's yet to reach the peak of that zone. He's on, he's on a recovery path, let's put it that way. And, and you can see the fluency that is you know, in the hand-eye coordination, in the cover drives, in the flick of the, uh, on the onside. And so you you sense that he is getting there and he's the big match player. He's the Mojo player. He's the Josh player, right? So he will uh, stand up. Followed by Mr. Surya Kumar Yadav. I don't want to jinx the gentleman, right? I mean, he is on a different plane altogether. Yet the point with him is that he cannot be given so much of pressure that his Mojo goes away. And I'm probably using this word a bit too often, but I, I do feel that in such marquee encounters, marquee tournaments, where your headspace is matters much more than anything else. So at the moment, his headspace is in the right space. Right? It's not going left, it's not going right, it's just on the ball and it's instinctual. And he's playing with some gay abandon, like freedom. And that has to continue in key matches, in key moments, in big matches. And the one that's coming up on Thursday is going to be probably the biggest match that he's ever played. And so the test of character will be proven then. Followed by 
Mr. Pandya. Mr. Pandya has been blow hot, blow cold. Clearly, nobody, listen, the disclaimer is nobody is doubting anybody's talent. If you have made it to the top 11 with potentially two other teams that could probably replace most people and, you know, play at the park, there is no doubting that. But somewhere I, I feel, and, and a lot of people might not like this, I still think he overdoes the short pitch theory. He does it a little too much. It's a alpha thing to do, right? I will still bounce you out. Let, why don't you try hitting me maybe for a couple of boundaries, but eventually you will give in. Uh, well, it's an ego thing. It's worked a couple of times. It hasn't a couple of times, but again, the word is the marquee encounter. Then, of course, is Mr. DK and Mr. Panth. What do you do of, with Mr. DK? He's really broken the door down to get to this place, right? So I was totally shocked and surprised to see Mr. Panth play. Now, Mr. Panth, in my view, and don't troll me for this, I still think he has to figure out the framework of his T20 innings in his mind. Not doubting his temper, uh, his ability or his talent. In his mind, he still not figured out the template for construction of his innings in a T20 match. I think he does it. In, he's probably getting the hang of it in test matches. Not seen him as much in ODIs, but clearly he seems to be a better player in test matches under pressure situations. He brings in the X factor, as it were. In T20, he has to still learn to figure out the the regulation of of the innings as it were and i don't know if it requires coaching from mr david mentorship from mr shastri i don't know whatever it takes there are enough people to advise him i just don't know why it is not getting through to him so the point is he's here or not here for the same reason of being inconsistent if he was so consistent he would have shut out shut the door for mr dk mr dk exists only because of mr Pant not getting up to scratch as it were Consistently enough, he's had some blinders out there. However, Mr. DK, now Mr. Karthik has, is in that zone where he knows that this is his probably last World Cup, probably, and I keep my fingers crossed. If you play well, I'm not thinking from an ageism standpoint, but that's how the cookie crumbles in Indian cricket, right? So my sense is he's too anxious to perform and somewhere he was previously just playing with gay abandon like he was like really tonking it out because he was he knew that if i if i see it i have to hit it in his mind he knows he's a 15 20 ball player right in his mind that is his role cut out so that thought clarity is there it's just that the quality of opposition is suddenly at an elevated level you are looking at 150 clicks you're looking at 145 consistently you're looking at short pitch given his vertical challenge it, it, it will can be above the you know rib cage area. These are uncomfortable shots to hit, and nowadays the wide, outside the off, tough shots to execute uh, given the situation. But he's there exactly to navigate that towards the end of the innings, be it the first uh, innings or finish it off in the second innings, which is little more tougher in my view. So somewhere he has to calm down, maybe take a step back, let it even within those fifteen. Um, deliveries that he has available to uh, play has to construct an innings even between these are like micro innings within a small innings i know these are exceeding it's easier said than done but constructing micro moments will help him as a summation of these good micro moments will get in him into this good zone and good score and eventually you know those instinct shots will start to reappear as of now he's starting to feel a little itchy, edgy, uh, given that whatever little that we have seen of him is it's not fired well, especially in the India-Pakistan match, in the manner in which he got out was worrying to me. It's like he stepped out of the crease and you were like still wondering where the ball was. The instinct is to first put your feet back, right? The moment you missed it, it should like trigger a synapse electric signal that, okay, now, oh, oh, I got to put. So I, I saw that response to stimuli a little lesser and I don't know, uh, if it was the occasion that got to him or if there was something else. The other thing is about the bowling. The bowling, we we are doing really well given the, everybody thinks that the bowling is the weakest link. Now it has helped us multiple times when the wickets were fresh, when there was swing, when there was um, the weather conditions, overcast conditions, it helped. Now we can only pray that on Thursday, 
and probably hopefully on Sunday there is somewhat those conditions favoring when we are bowling not when we are batting because we will clearly struggle if the ball is swinging we struggle we struggle with swing we struggle with extreme pace we have also struggled with spin in the batting department but that's for another another day for now the bowling department mr ashdeep singh clearly he is coming into into being as it were right he is is there He's probably i think a, a yard or two slower if he gets up to 142 144 he will be unplayable he'll be absolutely unplayable he'll be uh, probably bettering Mr. Shine Shah Afridi, I'd imagine, or giving him a run for his money. Uh, as of now, he's relying on the swing and he's got the in swing uh, and swinging it both ways. It's working well. But if uh, a latter part, and we are getting into November now, right? So think of that situation, those two, three overs, he will need to bowl really out of his skin. Mr. Bhavaneshwar Kumar, I don't know, you know, he starts off really well sometimes and then towards the end, I mean, he comes across very calm, but I think there is a lot going on behind the two years, behind or in the middle of two years. Uh, I think it's bowling too short. And again, the pace is something that is negotiable unless you bowl absolutely spot on. And to his credit, he has done that. Unless you do that, sometimes at 130, 131, it's negotiable, you know, it comes at a nice height, you know, in Australia, the pitches are slightly more bouncy. And so it, it it's it's like hit me kind of a shot, right? Right at the hittable height, the arc. And somewhere he has to outwit the batsman, which instead of solely relying um, movement after the pitching, somewhere he has to outwit the, outthink the batsman, which any bowler has to do. But in case of Mr. Mr. Kumar, he has to probably do that a little bit more. And as far as the rest of the bowling is concerned, Mr. Ashwin, well, somewhere I think he, he's trying to, I don't know, hurry the game up a little bit. His core strength lies when he slows the game down. And if you're listening to this, Mr. Ashwin, maybe you want to slow the pace down to 90 or 85, maybe. And you have bowled some slower delivers. I'm not give, uh, disagreeing with that. But somewhere, I think when you are tonked for a couple of boundaries, I think you try to dart one in uh, multiple times. And somewhere, you are probably the best candidate to outthink a batsman or outwit a batsman. And you will require that against uh, Team England and whoever we meet in the finals. Uh, but the worrying thing for you is not the bowling and certainly not the batting. What worries me is your fielding. Fielding somewhere, you stand out in the sense uh, it is evident that th that's the weak link. You have to start chasing even if the ball probably will uh, cross the boundary. If you give it a fair chase, this is the time to chase, right? This is no time to preserve. Two matches left, you have to give it everything. If this means that something gets bruised or some, you know, that's part of it. And I'm not doubting your intent or intention or anything, but probably you have to speed up your fielding a little bit. And that kind of gives you an overview of where the improvement areas are from a team perspective. But from a, if you zoom out from the matches that we played, we ran uh, the first match with Pakistan very close. To be fair, now that the adrenaline has dried down and strictly speaking, cricketing point of view, it's fair to say that Team Pakistan controlled the match for 60-70% of the time. It's because of heroics of one particular person we kind of got a lot of things went our way you know the stars aligned and so on, on a given day when things have to work they just work when they don't work that they, they don't work right so it's very important that we uh, re recognize the fact that, that it was not a comprehensive victory you are expected to win against teams who are way low ranked say a netherlands match or a zimbabwe match but against com competitive teams that of pakistan or uh, South Africa. In both matches, you really struggled. That's that's the right analysis. You won one of them and you lost the other one. And uh, you probably held the game until the 10th over against South Africa. And it kind of almost as if you switched off from the 11th to the 19th over. Like, not switched off. Well, you're like at your wit's end. Okay, these guys are talking me. Miller is talking me. What do you do? How do you disrupt the momentum? Can you do something different? Can you switch ends? Can you uh, slow the game down? I don't know. 
yes, there is, you can argue that the fielder will have to be brought in as a penalty if we over, if the over rate goes beyond the stipulated time. But somewhere we need to figure out to disrupt the opposition momentum. And I'm not talking sledging here or anything, cricketing ways. Is there a way we can disrupt the moment and manufacture something or engineer something vis-a-vis -vis going through the motions? And that's the sense I got from the South Africa match that you, I don't know what to do. The, I'm pitching here, is hitting here. I'm pitching there, is hitting there. Well, then the, the, concern with people, try something else. I don't know if Rohit Sharma should have bowled. Somewhere you have to try something. Yes, it might backfire, possible. But if you don't try, it is surely not going to work, right? You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So that's what I probably want to see from Mr. Rohit Sharma as the skipper, that you've tried to do something different when the going was going, game was getting away from you. So against South Africa on a spicy pitch, we can all say that, yeah, this we are not used to it and all that. But net of the story, when the crunch game came, we were struggling. And so the match against... Um, Team England on, on Thursday, and we'll discuss it in the next segment, we will have to plug these holes that have emerged in the group stages, right? All that, the whole team we just discussed. And last but not the least, why I appreciated the fact that we won the match against Zimbabwe without being complacent about it, without uh, barring having Mr. Panth play. Uh, we should have had DK a longish run in, in some sense given him like two, three overs to go and tong the ball so he gets his mojo back. But barring that, I think you finished off the game properly in a thumping way. It was not like a huffing and puffing and scraping victory. It was like a proper victory. So, so that's good job done. So that would be the overall sentiment summary observations for the group stage matches. In the next segment, we talk about what to expect in the semi-final and so it's the big Thursday, the big semi-final, the word semi-final, what does it ring a bell? missed opportunities, somebody played out of their skin and we lost. That's been the case for the better part of the last 10 years. Think of the Champions Trophy final, the ODI World Cup exit semi-final, the, the Test Championship, the last year's T20 World Cup exit at group stages. That left a very uh, confusing. It's like a dilemma thing, right? Here you are playing excellent cricket. You know, you are wowing people with your exciting brand of cricket and people are saying, wow, this is the team to watch out for. You probably have topped the rankings in many aspects of the game. But when it came to ICC tournaments, somewhere there was a choke tag and that is now snatched away <laughs> by South Africa. And uh, I really feel sorry for them. But Team India has not performed when it matters. See the talent that you bring to the table. Everybody knows that you will do well in matches which are inconsequential. The inconsequential bilateral matches. Now you can argue that no match at an international level representing the country can be inconsequential. Air quotes on that. However, what matters is when you prove world dominance. Unless you disagree with that. Unless you say, no, we are just here to participate. I think those days are gone. That was the time of, say, the 90s. Post Mr. Ganguly's, you know, mindset change that he introduced with, with uh, Indian cricket. My sense is we are now not just here to compete, but we are here to win. And we have done well. We have the talent, we have the facilities, we have the infrastructure, we have the process, we have the best coaches, we have the best everything. So then why is the title missing? And that's a legit question. That's a question which we, we can't, we have here... We have heard so much of very low and low quality post-match conversations, right? I mean, I don't know some of the respected journalists there ask very um, simple and straightforward. Nobody's asking them the hard questions, right? Like, I know you made a mistake. The question is why? And, and as a sports person, they would say, oh, it happens in sports, but it has been happening regularly now. So if you know it is happening regularly, why aren't you plugging the hole? It's it's a question, right? So I probably want to do a podcast one day, the top 10 toughest question for a press match, uh, for a press conference uh, after a, a cricket match, like a post-match conference, you know, something like that. These are all very cosmetic questions, right? So you played, what did you think about the game? Yeah, we played badly and so we lost. 
and so they it's a like a almost like a very sanitized version version of questioning with no real hard questions asked and no uh, clear answers given so these are all prepared remarks and somewhere we never get to hear the the real reason as to if you're getting out consistently outside the off stump and people are targeting you exactly for that then why aren't you re rectifying it are you not able to or are you confused or you don't want to you know if if uh, for for example getting out on the 45 and you know there is a person exactly positioned for that why are you repeating that shot again and again is the counter argument is yeah i am backing my talent i'm backing my natural instinct but you have to also play to the occasion you have to also play for the match right it's that balance that you express yourself and you know these are the terms that have been so abused you know they're like so overused that it's like a, there's a fatigue that you know they don't even need to do any of these pre-match and post-match shows because the questions are the same the answers are the same you can like record and play record and play why put up a farce of having this q a sessions anywho the long and short of it is that the fans are expecting you to win big marquee clashes that is the net of it you shouldn't have to scrape through group stages in the first place you have to raise the bar. You have to raise the bar of excellence that you score when it matters. You deliver and, and that's where you walk the talk. Otherwise, rest all is Maya. <laughs> rest all is just doesn't matter, right? You can play wherever, do whatever and, you know, have nothing matters. What matters right now is Team India break down this barrier that we can't win big moments or big matches. And that begins on Thursday. What do you need to do? So my sense is Team England bat very deep. So you have to pretty much out bat the opposition. You know that. But can you go a little deeper in that? What is, if the par score at the ground is 160 with a batting lineup of Team England, you have to go plus 30. And I'm, and I'm being a little more aggressive here. Plus 20 is for sure. Ideas to, to be safe, plus 30. If they beat you post that, you must have bowled exceedingly poorly or really bad or they played out of their skins. So you have to take the match to that level. And that can happen if you bat first. If you lose the toss, for example, and you bat first, if the power score is 160, you have to get to 190. That's one way of restricting uh, Team England towards getting there. And then you have to bowl and field really well. But if you're... If you win the toss and you chase, then chances are that you have a better probability. So if I were to give you a percentage, my sense is if you chase on Thursday, there is a 70% chance that you will probably pull it off given the consistency you have displayed in so far. On the And, and the fact that English bowling, yes, it is good, but I'm still barring if you can negotiate Mark Ward a little bit. It's not like that you... It's... Um, as threatening as say how South Africa or even as potent as uh, Team Pakistan's bowling is, is kind of relentless, right? 150 after 150 after 150. It's some not like that. So you can breathe easy a little bit. And so the best bet is you win toss, choose to uh, chase and then deliver without having to go down to number better number five, six or seven. That's the idea. However, if you do lose the toss and are inserted into batting, then you have to go to about plus 25 plus 30 other than that i if you don't do that then your win probability absolutely plummets like it will go down below 50 percent and then the pressure is on either the middle order or the bowling and the death bowling at 18 19 20 all of those things the problems have not got away they have not gone away to be i as an ordinary cricket fan i don't see how the problem has gone away you have done well against low ranking teams and made a thumping victory but in comparative teams you have kind of huffed and puffed and scraped through on the other side so that's the net of the story right so then how is it going to change in the semi-final unless you play some dramatic cricket again to end this segment i'll just say this right if time and again heroics is bailing you out then your process is failing you get what i'm saying if you are always in the search of Superman, turns out there is only one and sometimes he might not be able to do the job, right? And so if if the team chips in, everyone, you know, the risk is mitigated, the risk is divided. And so 
it is incumbent upon every single one of them on the park to contribute above their, their common average. And so, for example, the problem has been losing a wicket within the first six overs. Please make that a target as to not lose the wicket in the first six overs, even if that means you've scored, say, 50 runs or 45 runs. Anything below that, then that's again a problem, right? So if you get to about 50 runs in six overs, no problem. Then from over six to 16, you get another, say, 80, 90 runs still okay. So 90 and 60 are already at the 150 mark at around the 16th over or there or 17th over. Then 17th to 20th, you go hell, go for leather, right? I mean, you just, and within those micro uh, innings, you have to also ensure that if, uh, you know, you're just not trying to hit too hard and therefore getting out. And the, the ground dimensions are quite big. I think they're only 60 meters or 66 on, on the on the 45. So work that math out. I mean, all of this, you know, I mean, I'm referring this to as Team India. They already know all of this. The question is, when the crunch time comes, are you aware and you deliver on that? So long story short, net of it, summary of it is, we have seen you play excellent cricket in all matches, in those which do not in involve global teams together. Now, this is a marquee tournament. You have no excuses. There's no fatigue. There's adequate rest. There's no injury that is worrying anybody. People are in form. The bowlers are doing their job. The fielding has to lift its standards a little bit. And then you should be good to go. So the expectation is you put up a great fight. That's my expectation. What irks me the most, what really mind messes me is when you miss on the basics. That is very troublesome. You can't mess up on the basics. Yes, you played well, but the opponent played even better. Then that's fine. There's not much you can do because the opposition is here to win as well. They're not here to stroll in the park. They're here to win. And so they do something extraordinary. Then you have to give it to them, but cannot miss out on the basics. If you do your basics well and add this little bit extra, I'm guessing you will probably head to the finals. Let's talk about Friday. What's the biggest realization that you will have on Friday? That there is no draw in a T20 match. One team will win and one team will lose, right? And this is probably, this segment is probably for both the Indian and the Pakistani fans. If both our teams go on to win, the story is different. If both our teams go on to lose, the story is different. But in the common factor in both of these is we need to remain calm. So here is a humble request that don't, turn a competition into an ugly rhetorical and fight and where people are accusing and bringing in the religious angle and coming on all those kind of nonsense, right? It kind of destroys the spirit of the game. It kind of messes with the joy that people have gotten from uh, this wonderful caliber of cricket, this class of cricket, right? There will be a situation where one of the teams will lose and if if, for example, I can only talk about Team India, if we happen to lose, then we still have a work day the next day, right? There is a Friday to go to work. There will be a Monday to go to work. And so idea is not to get completely derailed by it. And like I said in the previous segment, if the team has fought well and the opposition has done something extraordinary, then we have to, you know, suck it up and say, yep, you did well and, and acknowledge that. I mean, it's fair. And the same logic holds to if we go on to win, uh, if we go on to be in the finals and we don't win the finals. Of course, it'll, it'll hurt. It'll, it'll mess with the mind for some point, but it cannot come out in outpouring of anger and we make insinuating remarks towards players and their families and, you know, all that kind of nonsense. It's not. It's immaturity. It's juvenile behavior. It's not even juvenile. It's, it's downright wrong. Because look at yourself sometimes. How many times have we messed up in crucial moments? How many times at work we have failed to meet a deadline, failed to deliver a report, maybe sometimes done something completely which backfired on us. Think of the people who have gotten angry with us. So the players will be hurting. Make no mistake, the players will be hurting. It's They are playing in front of you know a billion people. And they know there's, it's, it's in the back, they can claim it's just another game and all that, but the pressure is immense. And one can argue that's their job, right? It's, that's what they're paid to do. But 
if your team loses, you also have to stick with them. You never give up on your team, right? No matter what. Yes, we can feel hurt. We can feel disappointed. We will obviously have a critiquing of what went wrong, but then move on from that, right? Let's not get into wrong kind of uh, deductions that, oh, this, uh, like the other day I heard, it was emanating from uh, some people in Pakistan that, oh, the BCCI has bought the uh, umpires. I'm like, come on, let's not get there, right? This is 2022, whatever bad blood that has happened and, and it has happened in both countries. And uh, I think at least from an Indian cricket standpoint, I think we are cleansed. We are in a far better situation now than what we were say 20 years ago. And so clearly uh, those kind of commentary is not good. Then there is the religious angle to it. That's not just not fair, not, not right to make any comments on somebody's religion or their background or their families for that matter. And that, that is the real pits that that is not right right and umpire's decision is final sometimes it goes for you and sometimes it goes against you and it, it has happened with team india multiple times right the amount of times mr sachin Dulkar has been given out um, by uh, mr Baknur is not not even funny right it was and those were the days when replays were available and people could see it on screen and it, it happened multiple times right? so anyhow Ideas to look forward, ideas to stay calm, right? I mean, if, for example, Team Pakistan doesn't make it, please don't break televisions. Please don't come on your national television and abuse your players and how they are, you know, completely uh, not worth anything. Or for that matter, don't play the victim card. You know, the world is against us. It's like I've seen many a times that, you know, the David versus Goliath, theories put forward that oh, we are this small thing and people of the big bad, bad world is out to get us. It's not like that. We we play fair and we play hard. Sometimes we win and sometimes we don't. Yeah, also many of us have played the sport, right? And so we understand the pain when you lose. And yes, it is very disappointing when you lose on the basics. But the Pakistani team is very talented. Make no mistake about it. Right? And as a third person outsider, I'm saying this too the Pakistani people, if you ever get a chance to listen to this, you have a fabulously talented team. And that was never a doubt, right? Never, not now, not even in 2010, when you were probably going through the worst phase, talent was never the doubt, right? The question was execution of the talent on the park. And and so I, I the, the whole point is that team Pakistan has always had this reputation that precedes them of being mercurial. You know, they get charged up very easily. They get riled up very easily. And I'm sure now that they've come into the semis, there are 30,000 people who are riling them up. Right? Now we will, you know, nothing stops us. Like I'm quite happy as a cricket lover that there is a person of the caliber of Mr. Babar Azam who's got his head on his shoulders, right? He's not, he doesn't come across as the rhetorical type of guy. Don't make his life any more harder. Don't make his life any more tougher than what it already is. And somewhere give that the support. He seems to be a nice gentleman. And I think the team that he's trying, the team culture that he's trying to bring about is that of let's let the bat do the talking, let the ball do the talking, let's not let not the mouth do the talking. And that's the right way to go about it. Likewise, for Indian fans, especially if there are trolls, you know, either you don't understand the sport well or you've not played the sport well. And if there is some ulterior agenda narrative that you want to push, please, can you just for a brief moment in time grow up somewhere it is it happens in sport where a player tries his best but does not able to you know get to where they intend to and it's all right i mean it happens you have to learn to deal with failure people always teach us how to succeed nobody teaches us how to fail and that is an equally important time you have to fail if you fail then you yes you fail uh, gracefully with a dignified manner and but you also get up fast Right? You, you fail and you dust yourself off and, and you get up fast and the team will do that. Right, That's what they are mentally conditioned and coached for. But to make unparliamentary remarks, very uh, baseless commentary, pointing at their families and all that, that, that is very, that's that, that means you're not a true cricket lover. And if you are not one, then don't make somebody's life hell. Right? If you have a personal opinion or a personal angst 
against somebody, best bet is to keep it yourself. If you can generally contribute to the betterment of the sport in some way or the other, then absolutely. I mean, everybody in India is a cricket expert in some sense or the other. I'm not. I'm, I'm nowhere close to be an expert. I'm just an observer from the outside who's viewing the game very closely, objectively, with a non-rhetorical mind and just purely from a sporting angle. And I'm okay to be corrected. All the observations that I shared in this course of uh, this episode, I'm sure there are things which will go on to prove wrong or absolutely opposite, or there might be comments, well, Are did you not think about that? that? That's fine. I mean, people, I don't claim to be Mr. Know All or Know Everything. I don't. But the idea is to be honest about it, honest about it. It's not with any malice. It's not with any, you know, bad intention, right? So my humble request is this is going to be a big two days Wednesday and Thursday for both the teams. And if both teams win their matches and then we meet on Sunday, then that is going to be a mega occasion to uh, celebrate, even if one of the team loses, right? It's where both of the teams would have fought tooth and nail and the better team on that day won. And as cliched as it might sound, but that's how sport functions. That's how it works. And we wouldn't want it in any other way, but two highly talented teams compete with each, each other, and then one team betters the other one. Well, that's all the time I had for this edition of the Iron Man Experience. I hope you enjoyed this slow burn, detailed, non-rhetorical, simple style of sharing thoughts and views on something that I love very dearly, that's cricket. If there are any thoughts, comments, and suggestions, please do leave in the comment section below. Please do share with those who care and those who would like and have the patience to hear something like this at length and at leisure. I'd also appreciate if there are any ideas you want me to cover in next topic on cricket, on the World Cup or anything else, if I can. If I'm not able to do it, I'll absolutely steer clear away from it. But if I can, I'll definitely share or dedicate an episode to that particular topic. My social media handles are below, hashtag Ionisms. It's on Twitter, on Facebook. You can go onto the website www.podpage.com slash ionisms and so that you can see all the previous episodes because we, it's just not cricket. Talk about a whole bunch of things. Like I said, society, entertainment, culture, movies, arts, a um, little bit of geopolitics, everything. Right? So do give it a listen uh, when you find some time. I'm just getting started on, on my YouTube journey. It's something uh, I've been podcasting for a very long time. That is just the audio bit. So uh, I need all your uh, love and support and see if I can uh, take this further. Thanks so much. And till we meet again, peace out.